to, to this event, the speakers, uh, and of course our audience online. And 2024 is an election year. It's an election year in Europe. And we in the APRS have organized an event in December, and we are also going to organize another one in May in Florence. But it's also an election in India and in the United States, the three largest democracies in the world are voting. And it's interesting to watch these elections, not uh, only because of themselves, but uh, because they are relevant to the entire world. And the US election, presidential and Congress, has obvious implication uh, for the transatlantic relations. So it's a privilege to have today a distinguished panel to discuss these implications. Uh, Maida Ruge from the European Council of Foreign Relations, Bruce Stokes, visiting fellow at GMF. We still hope to have David Winston to join. He's, uh, he's struggling with the logistics um, from the Winston Group and Leslie Vinjamuri from Chatham House. And I think, Maida, you are the only one that has not taken part to uh, EPRS event previously. So uh, to the others, uh, welcome back. And the discussion will be moderated by our own Elena Lazaru. Uh, she's head of our external policies unit. But before we are going to listen to Danuta Rubna, chair of the delegation for relations with the United States in the European Parliament. Mrs. Rubna is uh, very well known uh, by us around this table, but let me just uh, recall a few elements for our audience. Uh, she was the first Polish EU commissioner uh, for, uh, for first for trade and subsequently for regional policy. She's professor of economics. Moreover, she's a member uh, in the current parliament of the Econ Committee, the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, and the Committee also of International Trade and constitutional affairs, so several committees in the European Parliament. Before joining the Parliament, she was the chief negotiator for Poland's membership uh, of the OECD and executive secretary of the European Economic Commission with the rank of deputy secretary general at the United Nations. In Poland, she led uh, the office of the Committee for European Integration and held the role of Minister of European Affairs overseeing the process of Poland's accession to the European Union. So we are privileged to have you with us today, Mrs. Hübner, and uh, over to you for the introduction to this panel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I would like to tell you that you wasted a lot of time to, to present my long uh, CV. So thank you very much for uh, for this. Uh, but uh, first of all, thank you to, to EPRS for the invitation and for bringing all of us uh, here uh, for the uh, discussion. I, I am extremely happy to see also uh, the panelists that already participated in the, the delegation for the relations with US uh, uh, meetings, and uh, there was it's pleasure to see you uh, again. Uh, I also think that uh, what we are going to discuss uh, today it is very very important uh, to our debates in the delegation for the relations with US uh, to our uh, work. And as the delegation is also a European component from the biannual EU-US interparliamentary meeting with the US House of, of uh, Representatives under the framework of this transatlantic legislators uh, dialogue, the, uh, the, the TLD, uh, I would also like to uh, say that we are uh, having in um, months from now, um, uh, exactly the 88th meeting of the um, uh, TLD, uh, and uh, we will have this meeting. So we will discuss with uh, our um, partners from the from the house the important issues of the future of our relations, and we will be doing it just two months before our European elections, and uh, uh, around six months, I think, before the US goes to the polls. Um, and as we as we see it from our perspective, the outcome of the uh, American uh, elections will will matter strongly for, for Europe, they will matter strongly for Ukraine, for our transatlantic uh, relations, but I would also say for the global world and for the uh, democracy. And uh, uh, actually what one can say is that the future transatlantic uh, relations will be decided by, by voters, by voters on both um, uh, sides of the Atlantic. And it is also true that uncertainty um, uh, is, is also on the European uh, side, uh, where a, a bigger than ever win of a hard right cannot be excluded. Uh, and building the centrist majority um, in the European Parliament then 
the consequences of it also for the council, for the commission, um, uh, will be extremely important to, to defend uh, pro-Europeanism, but also pro-Atlanticism and also democracy. Um, and uh, this is uh, what is our responsibility, I think, in the context of, of these elections on the European uh, side. We, we can see the, the probable outcome of American elections as a, as a new political reality with a new administration, with a deeply divided Congress and adjust to it through a kind of survival mode on the European side. But we can also reach out to America expecting political will uh, to continue cooperation between the US and the EU um, administrations also within the Trade and Technology Council uh, framework. We should also, under this approach, we should spare no effort to encourage stakeholders' engagement and cooperate more efficiently between the Parliament and the uh, Congress or the House of Representatives. And as you, as you know, during the President, during President Biden era, we managed to build a, a rather solid, I would say, foundation um, uh, benefiting uh, our bilateral interests, but also consolidating uh, our uh, common um, uh, global agency, I would uh, say. Uh, but in today, when you look at what's going on in European media uh, with regards to, to our relations, there are many comments and assessments uh, of what it might mean to, to see also Donald Trump as next American uh, president. Uh, why? Because his statements were not ignored. Uh, I think including also the assault on Article 5. Also a bitter aftertaste, I think, stayed with us Europeans after we heard about uh, Putin being invited to do uh, whatever the hell he wants. Um, so it does not come, I hope, uh, as a surprise that in this pre-electoral Europe, uh, the debate on strengthening the European defense uh, dominates, but both in terms of our short-term ability to support uh, Ukrainian war efforts, uh, but also the, the long-term strategic direction for building um, the, the European defense industrial uh, capacity. And as you can imagine, not only the need to invest more, but as usual in Europe, also how to finance it, uh, how to finance um, uh, the, the, this new defense industrial capacity strategy, uh, including joint borrowing. This is all under uh, discussion. And as you can imagine, uh, this is not at all an easy discussion in um, uh, Europe. Uh, but our common European concern is also influenced strongly by worsening situation in Ukraine battlefield and also the paralysis um, accompanied, maybe I can say, uh, by the paralysis in the divided uh, Congress, because the war is not a short-term challenge anymore, I think, and it is not anymore the aggression of Putin on Ukraine, but it is Putin's war against the, the West. So all those issues that I was just touching um, uh, I think they create a, a new context for our defense industrial uh, strategy. Uh, despite those parochial interests uh, of some member states and also some industries, I believe that after European elections, decisions will come rather quickly regarding EU strategic uh, defense uh, power, uh, its funding and also institutional uh, solutions that might accompany this, uh, these efforts. Um, uh, but if, when you look in, in more general terms, terms, I think that there are many questions related to this new political reality, which cannot be seen separately. So I think we are in a situation where we have to, to bring all those issues uh, together and, and see the, the, uh, the joint uh, uh, impact on, 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 on our uh, reality and, and also the impact of the political reality on all those factors, taking them all uh, together. And I think that from that perspective, the dominating view, um, a public view in, in Europe uh, is that the, the free world should stick together to face uh, autocratic regimes and this uh, reinventing itself uh, world. And it is true that um, uh, we as transatlantic alliance, I think we maybe in more general terms as democratic global alliance, we failed in isolating Putin globally. 
uh, we will also see China and Russia getting closer. Uh, there is also the fear of a greater war in, in, in Europe. In some member states, it's, it's more prominent as a fear. And as the, uh, as, as the, I mean, I, I wanted to say expectation, but, but in the negative uh, sense as a, as a threat. And the question is whether Europe can prepare for a greater war without US when the, the world around becomes more and more dangerous. So the biggest question in, in this context, taking into account all those factors and the, what can happen, the biggest question for us is, is in this dangerous where is where will be the president of America and America in, in this uh, world? The, the, the polarized, polarized world will, will be looking closely, I think, at the, um, at the future strengths of the EU-US joint international uh, action. And if we start showing signs of disunity, the, the price to pay later, both in financial but also uh, geopolitical terms, will be much uh, higher. Uh, we, 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 I think we can say, uh, at least we are worrying here, that the outcome of those, um, of the US elections will determine the transatlantic relations, the future of them, perhaps beyond uh, 2028. So not just elections now, uh, but also America uh, post 2028. And the question is whether it, America will be able uh, to go back to all the essential elements of our cooperation, the values, and also what we are, what we have been doing so far, which we might need to pause for a while. But will there be a comeback to, to this uh, situation that we have been having for the last four uh, years or eight years? There is also a risk that uh, the situation in, in, in America after election, elections might also um, accelerate the, the reversal of democratic processes across the, the world. We all know that there are many, many elections and the only predictable is about Russia. We know who will be the president of Russia, but many are not predictable, um, but uh, the democratic processes might, might be um, uh, reversed. And no, no doubt, I think, uh, this will be a world where the global transatlantic agency would be extremely useful uh, to cope with this transformative uh, remaking um, of the world. But my worry is that Europe might be once again seen by the president of America as an irrelevant ally or uh, on some issue like 2% or um, def trade deficit also hostile, uh, on others probably ungrateful. Um, and efforts to divide European unity might be also undertaken. We, we know it from the experience, but I hope they will be smartly handled on the European um, side. And it comes to my mind also that it would be important for, uh, for us to identify, I'm looking for your advice also, to identify among the officials in the new administration those having good understanding of bilateral and, and also global uh, transatlantic mutual um, interests, because we all know that they exist. Um, also, there seems to be, um, uh, we, we see it as a challenge, actually I was encouraged by, uh, by Dr. Vinjamuri presentation in, 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 in our meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, that there seems to be also a little awareness among large sections of American uh, society of the value of the EU-American uh, partnership or relationship, uh, that there is no knowledge, and we all know it too, too well, uh, of millions of jobs that are created by mutual trade, by mutual uh, investment. Uh, there is little awareness of the security cooperation that we uh, have. Um, in general, I would say there is uh, little awareness of contribution of transatlantic ties to the uh, wealth and progress of, of their own uh, country, of, of America. And, and I'm also personally worried because we have been committed here very strongly also as the parliament, probably much stronger than Congress, uh, to the TTC and, and, and its uh, achievements, its, its, its work, uh, whether this will be able to continue providing that it is a, an extremely important kind of vehicle for uh, continued closer uh, cooperation. Uh, 
So our task to, to explain to Americans why peace in Europe matters uh, for them, why financial and military support for Ukraine today is the cheapest way to, to make Americans safe in the future, to avoid also strengthening the uh, Putin in his war against the, the West or, or beating also the up global power of authoritarian uh, regime. This is what we have to do. I hope we can do it jointly. Um, and if we fail and all those bad things uh, happen, uh, then the big question is how interested the new administration, but also Congress, can be in Ukraine reconstruction, because sooner or later this task is, is ahead of um, uh, us. So I, I think that for the EU, for the US, for the rest of Western world, supporting uh, Ukraine's brave um, uh, defense must be regarded as a question of our own uh, survival. Uh, the very basis of international law is in jeopardy, uh, as is also the uh, the future of uh, democracy. Uh, we have just witnessed uh, recently, once again, the Kremlin's uh, readiness to crush its own citizens by taking Alexei Navalny's life. So the, the EU has been, um, which was also a big success <laughs> when, when one think about the European Union, uh, that we have been united and uh, we have been a strong defender of, of Ukraine, uh, not least with the recent January decision uh, which was not easy at all uh, to provide a further uh, 50 billion euro, um, but but uh, we are really uh, awaiting uh, for this similar effort from the uh, US, uh, which is which is overdue uh, practically and also indispensable. Uh, this is very clear. So I also hope that the our colleagues in the House. Um, uh, will will see this need of overcoming urgently the, the impasse over funding for um, uh, Ukraine. But we are also worrying, especially after the example in Poland, we are also worrying about the possible post-electoral electoral pathologies. We already know the, the risk. Uh, we know that political victory might not lead to immediate political stability in the, um, in the US, but we also hope that this time voters will be more vigilant, so, but of course there can be new forms also of manipulations. Um, and I guess that we on both sides of the Atlantic, we also have to prepare, um, to be prepared to handle the disinformation, which probably will be a, just broadly used on both sides um, a, of, the, of the Atlantic. Uh, we are also aware of the foreign interference um, uh, potential, especially also with AI. Uh, and also efforts to undermine the, the results uh, before, but during and, and after uh, elections. So we are, uh, I mean, just the list of these worries that we have and where we hope that you will just help us to find a solution uh, to some of them at least, because among our worries is also the, 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 the fact that if there is this kind of contempt of, uh, for NATO that, that might be, uh, might take place. This might open a bigger space also for China uh, in, in Asia, especially to act on Taiwan. And also, if our alliance on China is weakened, then it might uh, accelerate the China's action uh, to becoming an alternative global uh, power center. Um, and it would be good, therefore, to, uh, to see the continuation. That's my question also to you, how you see it to see the continuation of American efforts to maintain uh, America's dominant position globally. You, Europe wants to see America strong and, and uh, um, capable of, of influencing what's going on in the, in the world. We, we want to be uh, allies on, on, on this, but we think that it's very important as well. And ultimately, and this will be my last sentence, um, uh, and rightly, the power on electoral uh, the power and the electoral decisions um, uh, belong to, to, to Americans in American decision, uh, election and Europeans uh, here. And these election campaigns and the results should not blind us, however, I would say, to the fundamental principles that have assured our common values, uh, our common interests and security. Um, not just for the last four years, but actually for, for the last eight uh, decades. And we have this feeling that 
the history of watching both of us, both sides of the Atlantic, and that's why we probably should uh, deliver. And uh, we, as Europe, we still see that delivering together will be probably uh, easier um, uh, for all of us. So thank you for for just giving me this just chance to say on behalf of all the colleagues this, these few ideas about um, the, uh, not ideas, but just to to show you what are our worries and how much we also need your intellectual. Um, uh, support and, and ideas to, to 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 do this future proofing uh, or whatever we, we call it, or just to use uh, in the best possible way the, what is ahead of us when it comes to the transatlantic uh, relations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hubner. Um, I I took note of so much that you've said. You've given a strong message of transatlantic unity already to start us out with, and one coming from uh, the Parliament and and reminding us that it's not just about the executive branch, but it's also about the legislative branch uh, that this relationship can is based on and can build on. And I also want to appreciate how many times you made a plea for expert advice. And I have to say that in our time of disinformation and various narratives around, it's really uh, very much appreciated to have policy, which is evidence based and which looks to those institutions that are fact based and research based that our speakers here today represent for advice and for guidance. So very much appreciated. Uh, on my behalf, I'm Elena Lazaro. I had uh, the external policies unit of the EPRS. I'd like to welcome our audience and our speakers. Uh, we have about 130 people online at the moment and they're increasing. So um, in spite of CNN being a very worthy competitor, as I've been looking at the results coming in from Super Tuesday, we also have quite an important audience and this speaks to the quality of the speakers and the, the salience of, of the issues. So uh, it's really a good day to be having this conversation. Um, I, I want to make a few introductory remarks before introducing our panel uh, in the hope also that we, we have a technical problem with one of our panelists and I'm hoping he'll manage to connect in the meantime. Um, obviously, it's Super Tuesday today, a number of primaries uh, happening as we speak. Uh, very predictable in terms of the, the candidates on both sides, but also some key Senate and House primaries. And I think it's important to remember that we're not just looking at who the next president will be, but we're also looking at what the constellation of the executive and the legislative branch will look like and you, what will what will the House look like. So, so that's also important when we look at those races. So it's an important day in the US. Uh, it's an important day here in Brussels. We've just had the release of a major package on defense industrial strategy and defense industrial programming with, with legislative items included. And as, um, as Professor Hubner has alluded to, uh, defense has become an issue in the transatlantic relationship and it's become an issue of salience to voters. I would say in the US, in the EU, and even globally. And this really speaks to the kind of geopolitical environment that we are in today. Um, some time ago, and Bruce, you'll confirm this as someone who's been looking at elections for years, we used to say that foreign policy didn't matter so much to the average voter. But I think what we may be hearing today is that you know, in the current environment, aspects of foreign policy do matter. And that's just one of the many things we'll discuss. So our speakers today will have the very challenging task of not only discussing what we're expecting to see in terms of voter turnout, in terms of how today will turn out, uh, and, and how will people come out to vote? What will the salient issues be? How will things pan out looking towards November? but also to see how the global interacts with the national in this U.S. election, uh, how those issues that have a transatlantic and global dimension will uh, come into uh, the voters' decisions, what the implications will be for transatlantic relations and also for international relations, because it's, it seems to me, and, and uh, what we've just heard confirms this, is that we are really at a critical moment regarding uh, multilateralism and global cooperation? Will it be democracies versus autocracies? Uh, will the EU and the US uh, manage to uh, work together in terms of engaging partners in the so-called global south? Uh, all these seem to also hinge 
on what the outcomes are of elections around the world, but especially in the US and the EU as we're talking about transatlantic relations. So really a lot to discuss. I think uh, Professor Hubner put it very, very well when she said this is the discussion about the future of global transatlantic agency and that it will be decided by voters. Uh, so it's an important moment for democracy. Having said that, just to briefly introduce our panel, which I think is does not need an introduction, but uh, for those of you who are on the call, I'd like to welcome, in the order in which they will be speaking, uh, Bruce Stokes, a visiting senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the US, um, who's also been involved in uh, the German Marshall Fund's work on uh, Ukrainian recovery. Uh, and he was also the editor of the Transatlantic Trends uh, surveys, which we regularly had in our US delegation meetings here in the European Parliament, but also a minute of self-promotion here, who has recently uh, done a study for us on the, the future of EU-US relations after the Inflation Reduction Act, which I really recommend uh, for everyone to read. So thanks, Bruce. Um, after Bruce, we'll be hearing from Leslie Benjamuri, Director of the US and America's program at Chatham House, Chair of the Faculty at the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership in International Affairs at Chatham House, and Professor in International Relations at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Uh, welcome, Les, it's nice to see you. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Maid Ruge, Senior Policy Fellow with the US program at the European Council on Foreign Relations, who has written extensively about domestic uh, US uh, for polit politics and US foreign policy, transatlantic relations, and might, if I'm not mistaken, soon to be part of the ECFR office in Washington, if I'm not mistaken, although you're in Brussels at the moment. So very nice to have you on the call. We're missing one speaker, David Winston, for technical reasons. Uh, if we manage to get him in, I'll bring him in uh, whenever that happens, but uh, we will hope to share some of his thoughts and his presentation exposed to the event. Having said that, um, I'll give the speakers their first seven, eight minutes for their initial remarks, starting with Bruce and his uh, presentation uh, of what we should expect to be seeing, which I think has become a regular in our US events. Bruce, floor is yours. And uh, Cecile, I think we have the PowerPoint. Thanks, Elena. And it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be with everyone. Uh, and I certainly, uh, Look forward to the comments of my fellow panelists and to the questions from the audience. Um, first off, I'd like to associate myself with Professor Huebner's uh, 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 intervention. Um, I think that it's not a partisan thing to say that this election is an election between the most pro-European U.S. president since Dwight Eisenhower and the most anti-European president since I don't know who. So I think that uh, the future of transatlantic relations really may hinge on the outcome of this election in ways that it never has in the past. So with that, um, let me uh, go to um, the, the slides that we have and some of the public opinion data. Um, I would urge uh, our listeners to understand that public opinion data is a snapshot in time. It is you ask people a question, they give you an answer, you report the answer. Uh, it's usually an emotional response, not a rational response, but people vote on emotions. So it's important that we know well, how they're feeling. Uh, and it's now uh, uh, 10 months before the election. So we, we still, uh, this could change uh, certainly over time. Uh, people tell us that immigration is the most important problem facing the country. Although I would point out to you that an economist survey uh, found something slightly different, which was that it was political extremism was what people were most worried about. But as you can see from this Gallup poll, uh, it's immigration, it's, it's become more of a concern. Um, and uh, a number of issues, foreign policy, for example, are really down near the bottom if you ask people a range of, of issues to focus on. Um, it, it, I think it's impossible for people outside the United States to understand how partisan public opinion is in the United States, um, with Republicans saying their priority issues are the economy and immigration, and Democrats saying it's health care and the environment. You can see in this list of, of uh, issues that people say they want 
something done on this year uh, on almost every issue on environment. It's a 40 percentage point difference between Democrats and Republicans on uh, uh, immigration. It is uh, a huge difference on the economy. It's a huge difference. The American public is deeply, deeply divided on almost every issue. Uh, views in the economy are picking up. People are slightly more positive about the economy than they were in the past, but the partisan differential in the economy has grown dramatically. Uh, as you can see at the beginning of the Biden administration, Democrats were more positive about the economy than Republicans. There was a 20 percentage point difference in at the beginning of the Biden administration. That's now a 40 percentage point difference. We can debate whether people should or shouldn't be feeling better about the economy. But what we know is that even though, even as Republicans feel slightly more positive about the economy, Democrats feel much more positive. And this is one of the things that divides the electorate on foreign policy issues, which, as Elena said, often are not hot, first and foremost in people's minds. Uh, three times as many Republicans as Democrats say we should decrease or end U.S. NATO commitments. I mean, obviously, this is something of deep interest in, in Europe. As you can see, that it has become a very partisan issue in the among the American electorate. Uh, three times as many Republicans as Democrats say the U.S. should give is giving too much aid to Ukraine. Uh, again, uh, a majority of Republicans say we give too much, uh, and only 17 percent of Democrats say that. It's one of the reasons aid to Ukraine is stuck in the Congress. In terms of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, six in 10 Republicans say they would back a candidate who would increase military aid to Israel. Only four in 10 Democrats agree. Uh, if you ask a different question, which people have asked about who you support more, the Israelis or the Palestinians, even though the majority of Americans say they are more supportive of the Israelis, the percentage who say they are more supportive of the Palestinians keeps growing, especially among among young people. In the head to head uh, contest that's coming up uh, in the latest New York Times poll, uh, which just came out on Sunday, uh, Trump leads Biden by five percentage points among registered voters and four points among likely voters in the American situation. A likely voter is someone who says they've actually voted in the past because that's probably the better indicator of who will vote in the future. The Wall Street Journal came out with a poll on Monday and it showed the same five percentage point difference. Uh, so Trump clearly seems to be leading uh, at this point. Uh, one of the reasons he may be leading is that Republicans are more enthusiastic about him then Democrats are enthusiastic about Biden. And pollsters and political people believe that enthusiasm is a very important indicator of who's going to win. Because enthusiasm means you will actually go get that mail-in ballot or you'll go stand in line in the rain on election day and vote because you're excited. Um, Republicans' disapproval of Biden's handling of various issues exceeds Democrats' approval, again, as a sign of of enthusiasm for their candidate, as you can see, uh, not only in overall job performance, but on how Biden is handling China or handling foreign policy or handling the economy. It's not that Democrats don't approve of what he's doing. They do. But Republicans tend to disapprove even more strongly. A majority of the public says the economy and the country are worse off under Biden. But a majority of Democrats say things are better. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, while a majority of Democrats say the economy is doing better under Biden and that the country is doing better under Biden, it's only a plurality of Democrats who say they and their families are doing better. So this, this disconnect between observations of what's happening in the country and what's happening to me personally uh, undermines some of the support for Biden's handling of the economy. We can get into a discussion about whether the economy is actually benefiting people more or not. And the data is all over the map. Um, concern about Biden's age, as many of you may know, is a big issue in this campaign. Let's 
be honest, Biden is too old to be president. Trump is too old to be president. He, he will be, if Trump gets elected, he will be the oldest man ever inaugurated as president. But these are the two candidates we have to choose from. So uh, the question is, whose age will hurt the candidate the most? It's a highly partisan issue. Uh, Democrats basically say they don't think Biden is too old to be severely limited in his ability to do the job. And um, basically, the Republicans believe he is too old to, to do a good job. Um, if you look at what people tell you about various positive and undesirable and desirable traits about the candidates, as you can see, the public says Joe Biden is elderly, he's forgetful, he's out of touch, and they say that Donald Trump is egotistical, a bully, and an authoritarian. So these are the kinds of emotional uh, attributes that they attribute to the various candidates. Um, Trump once bragged in the 2016 campaign that he could shoot someone on New York's Fifth Avenue and his supporters would still back him. And frankly, if you look at this answer to this question, he probably knows his voters pretty well. This was a YouGov poll asking people uh, about the various uh, court cases against Trump. Remember, he's been indicted 91 times. And whatever the issue is, obstruction of the election, uh, falsifying business records, uh, holding classified documents and trying to keep them away from the FBI. Democrats say this should disqualify him as pres to be president. And Republicans say, We're, we really don't. It doesn't bother us at all. So it's one of the real uh, partisan differences as we look forward. Those of you who follow in the American election realize that the popular vote in the American election doesn't matter. It's the electoral college vote. This was a system set up in 1789 to pacify Southern slaveholding states who uh, were thought they'd be outvoted by the North, the bigger North. Uh, we are still stuck with this 250 years later, and which it means that there may be six states in this country where who wins the popular vote in those states will then determine who gets elected president. And in each of all those six states, Trump is now leading Biden. So this is something to watch very, very closely. However, whoever wins, uh, this is going to be the best election that money can buy. Political spending is expected to be nearly $9 billion, five times greater than 2012. For those of you, who've, again, who follow American elections, we have a, an issue in our elections, which the Supreme Court has said is not a problem, which is that money talks in the election. And uh, the amount of money that is being spent in this election cycle will, as I said, be five times what it was in 2012. Um, one of the bigger issues will be that the election is not likely to resolve the legitimacy, legitimacy divide. When people are asked, uh, will you accept the outcome of the election? 70% of Trump voters say they won't accept it. And if there's a if there's a Biden victory, and 46% of Biden voters say they won't accept a Trump uh, outcome. This is a very dangerous situation for democracy because we have long believed that democracy in a democracy, you're supposed to accept the outcome of the election and get ready for the next one. Uh, and finally, uh, for those of you who follow things going on in Washington, you, you know that we are in deep gridlock over Ukrainian aid, over aid to Israel and, and Gaza, over a range of issues, over our budget. One of the reasons we have such a deep divide is that we have divided government. We have three houses, the three, three parts of the legislative and executive branch, the House, the Senate, and the White House. In the 10 elections between 1960 and 1978, control of the House, the Senate, and or the White House changed three times. So you generally had unified government. In the next 10 elections, the control changed four times. In the last 12 elections, the change 
control has changed 10 times. Uh, and the assumption among most political observers is that we will continue with an, ele uh, an 11th time when the government is divided, that it's highly likely the House will become Democratic, going from Republican to Democratic. The Senate will go from being democratically controlled to Republican controlled, and then the White House is up for grabs. Uh, but again, I would say for people outside the United States, uh, assume there will be more gridlock in Washington after this election. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, really interesting and a lot to, to dissect there. And I, I am sure that, that our next speakers will do so. Um, as you were showing us your presentation, I was thinking of, of so many aspects of democracy that one could comment on. So the polarization of the narratives, clearly there is no universal truth anymore. It's very politicized, um, but also you know, accepting the result of elections, which now seems to be a thing that is uh, up for discussion, which uh, you know, clearly links to, to the quality of democracy. And it made me remember that uh, Leslie wrote a piece, I think it was late last year, on uh, democracy being at stake in this election. And the piece was not just about US democracy, but also about democracy globally. So I'd like to invite Leslie to uh, give us her opening remarks, both on the domestic, but also on the global implications of, of what you've just presented for democracy and beyond. Um, yeah, first of all, Elena, thank you. Thank you for convening us, leading us with your um, expertise and ideas and um, for inviting me on the panel. It's great to be here. Bruce, I'm thoroughly depressed <laughs> having listened and watched your slides. And, I, and some of what I say might be a little bit of an effort to maybe, um, I mean, I, how can one disagree with the data and you do it so well? Maybe I'll try and, you know, piggyback on some of it, push back against some of it and, and raise some additional questions. I mean, I think when I look at the data, such as it is right now, um, I probably, like you, Bruce, tend to think that um, there's a lot that that tells us, but also to take it with a grain of salt, because, of course, we are so far away um, in terms of people's emotions, their everyday experience, and something that I think is very difficult to inject into polling, which is their sense of consequence. And the sense of consequence you feel about the person that you're going to put in the White House is radically different eight months before an election than it is when it's actually going to happen. So not only are we going to have global events that, that change, and we don't know exactly in which way, obviously the war in the Middle East, which is affecting young people enthusiasm and passion and feelings about especially President Biden. Um, we could have any number of climate disasters. The economy is on a good path in the United States. People aren't feeling it now, especially um, many of the people that are working class voters in swing states weren't, according to the Consumer Financial Services Bureau, weren't feeling that effect in their pocketbooks as recently as a couple of months ago. That effect might change, um, but you know, people's material experiences, the world, and their sense of what it means to return, however unenthusiastic, a number of uh, Democrats and Biden leaning or Democrat leaning independents might feel about um, a president that is 81 years old and isn't great when it comes to delivering speeches, they're going to think harder when it's a presidential election and, and not a primary. And that I think is something that we cannot measure. And I, I just would say again and again and again, there are a lot of people right now in the United States, and we all know this, those of us who spend time outside of Washington across the country. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Midwest. My mother's there, she's elderly. Uh, and talking to people, and people want this to go away. You know, by and large, a lot of Americans would like this whole thing to go away. A lot of people do assume that Trump is going back. If you ask them what it means, uh, wealthier Americans, many of them think that it means that, you know, not a lot will change, but depending on their sector, they might do better because you might, you know, cut taxes and further deregulate. But, but there is a, a lack of enthusiasm, and that, I think, is going to radically change. So, 
be careful, I think, of reading off of very serious data that Bruce has presented into where we're going to be. Um, I guess my, I do think that, I guess, second point in response to some of the data is, you know, we know that the economy is going to matter and people's own personal experience of it and the projection of how the policy will or won't change. Um, and then we we tend to take these baskets and, you know, separate them out and, you know, people care about immigration, they don't seem to vote on foreign policy in general, et cetera. But there's this other thing that I think we have a hard time measuring, which is that, you know, next generation voters, young voters care about a whole lot of things. They care about climate. They care about a woman's right to choose. They, they have a, you know, maybe a more global outlook on certain issues, but they don't disaggregate. You know, we disaggregate these things for polling. We have to, there's another way to, to measure them. But I think a lot of people, when they go to the polls, they sort of say, is this person like me? Do they represent my values? And they don't necessarily kind of go economics, immigration, climate, pro-choice, whatever. They put it together. And, you know, my best bet is that when people put it together in November and they look at their choices, we're going to get a lot of people that are scared. And that even if they don't like President Biden, they're going to be scared of a return of Donald Trump. And I think that we will see more people voting Democrat than the national level polling or even the swing state polling um, shows us. So I am, you know, by no means sanguine. I think it's phenomenally urgent, the state of democratic politics, small d democratic politics in the US, but just um, a little bit more cautious on some of the negativity in that's um, not from the data, but in the media. So I would say dial it down. It's good for, you know, it's good for journalism, but let's be a little bit more measured. Uh, second point, um, I do think that the, the, this, the risk for democracy is very considerable, primarily because of the divisive politics that will emanate from the White House and that will empower a certain kind of rhetoric and leadership at multiple levels if Donald Trump is reelected. And that I think is one of the gravest risks to democracy. People need to be able to work together, not only in Congress, they need to be able to work together in churches and in schools and in all sorts of local and national institutions and state level institutions and that is more difficult to do if the person at the top is sowing division. And so that that uh, Peter Baker, Susan Glauser book, The Great Divider, tremendous title. And it's the thing that I think we have to worry about. We've heard about, you know, Project 2025 and Schedule F. And I, I've spoken about that before. I'm sure many of us have. That, I think, is a real concern. And um, and and I think it's, you know, perhaps worth talking about more. Next point. Um, I do agree with the thesis that many people have put out there, which is that the direction of travel on America's global engagement bears a similarity, whether it's a Biden-led administration, a Trump-led administration, or you know any other alternative. And again, we could end up in an alternative universe given that we've got two older presidents and a volatile domestic electoral state of affairs. Um, but the direction of travel, America being more constrained financially, having a very significant debt burden, not wanting to cut entitlements, spending a lot of de on defense, facing a more competitive environment, facing China, um, which is modernizing in a way that the U.S. needs to take account of when it comes to nuclear and defense and security more generally, um, facing a global economy that requires it in order to be to com competitive, to really focus on um, technological competitiveness and markets and all the rest of it, and a domestic polity in which, you know, the demand for um, looking after individuals is rightly uh, front and center and will remain so, it means that there is a direction of travel, right? That, that focus on the Indo-Pacific, however it gets, um, However, it's executed, however delayed, it will continue to be there. So there's a direction of travel. However, it matters how you get there. And this is where I think the fact that we've got two candidates with radically different worldviews of America's rightful position, America's relationship to other states, it's the desirability um, and the benefit uh, materially of working uh, with or not working with partners and allies um, all of that means that the the way that this unfolds 
uh, it might be kind of heading towards a broadly similar goal, but the how you get there couldn't be more consequential. And I think that's where the very radical divide is. We're going to hear about Europe. I'll just say a couple of words on maybe the, the global economy question, global public goods and China. On global public goods, I'm deeply worried if Trump is reelected. We're already struggling. We saw the response to COVID, um, which in which you know um, the U.S. just simply didn't stand up. I think that would have been better had Biden been in place for the years leading up to COVID. Um, but if there's another pandemic, we already have clearly a massive climate challenge um, and the need for investing in our multilateral institutions is a very real concern. It is a challenge. The current administration is working around as well as working through as best as can. And I think that would be very significantly disrupted. And I will put that at the list of very grave concerns. And it's the, in some ways, it's the workarounds that I'm more worried about than the working through, because the working through, whether it's the UN Security Council or the, or the World Trade Organization uh, or the World Health Organization, there's a lot of things that are stuck regardless, but the workarounds have been quite effective um, and solutions-based working in smaller multilaterals, and I'm concerned about that. Um, on, on China, a lot of people like to say the China policy will be the same regardless. I just don't buy it. I think that the Biden administration has worked very, very hard to get a degree of measure and diplomacy back into a very, very difficult relationship. And I think that that will be disrupted if there is, if there is a change of leadership to Donald Trump. He's talking about revoking MFN status, putting on 60% tariffs, going into a very blustery, disruptive um, kind of engagement that isn't really about solving problems. It's as much about talking to people at home. So I think not only the China strategy, but the broader Indo-Pacific strategy of working with partners, whether it's the trilateral engagement with South Korea, Japan, and the US, whether it's the Quad, whether it's the admittedly very you know preliminary IPEF um, uh, framework, all of that I think is you know at, at very significant risk if there's a, a change of leadership. Um, and then the economy more general, you know, the U.S. again, a direction of travel, which is very much focused on jobs for Americans on a kind of industrial policy and a more clear role for the state. You know, you could argue that a Trump administration would change that because it doesn't kind of, you know, like intervention, but it would it would be it would be changed for something, I think, more disruptive and much more difficult for America's partners to manage, not least possibly enforcing that choice that everybody's been very concerned about, which is you know, choosing between China um, and the US in a context where what the US is offering, both rhetorically, stylistically, and materially, could be um, quite unpalatable, uh, but without a really great alternative. And I will end there. That's not very optimistic. I was trying to be more optimistic. <laughs> But um, I guess the point of optimism is, I, I mean, I will, put my, I will put my cards on the table. I do not think Donald Trump will be reelected. However, I certainly, as a, as a small D Democrat, as that is an individual citizen of the US, I won't be acting on that basis. I think that one has to um, be quite vigilant with one's political engagement and participation. Thank you very much, Leslie. It started out positive, but I, the mood uh, sort of uh, <laughs> declined from there. But 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 you know, a huge number of points, and uh, and and the, the the issue of polarization reminds me of one of the first things that President Biden said when he got elected. He said if he would try to end the polarization, and clearly now we're so many years later and we're talking about it again, the divisive politics. So, yeah, it's still still some work to be done. Um, but uh, you mentioned a couple of points that I think will easily take us to, to the EU uh, and to Maida's comments, uh, apart, of course, for the impact for, for, for global uh, international relations. You mentioned the youth vote, which I think is important because here in the EU, we will also have, we expect to have a huge number of, a huge increase of youth vote, uh, given that a number of member states have now introduced the option to vote for younger uh, younger um, 
voters as of 17 years old, but also you mentioned Project 2025 and the Heritage Foundation uh, huge study, which uh, in it contains a lot of the elements of what we expect to see if, if Trump were re-elected in terms of engagement with the EU and which has uh, made many of the experts on this side of the Atlantic, including Maida, to, to look into what the implications of that would be. I remember, Maida, this podcast that Jeremy Shapiro and you did uh, in November, exactly a month ahead of the election, a uh, year ahead of the election on this. So um, I'd like to invite you then to to comment on on what we've heard so far, but also to give your input on the transatlantic dimension of what we can expect. Just before I turn the floor to you, I'd like to say I see questions coming in already. I'd like to remind our virtual audience that you can ask your questions by entering them in the chat. Uh, to everyone or to me directly, as you prefer. And uh, after we finish with Maida's comments, we'll go to your questions and, and have some discussion among the panels. So Maida, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elena. Maybe kind of, and, and such a pleasure and honor to be your guest for the first time. Um, perhaps to start with a very simple um, point, I will not be joining the Washington office. Um, our ECFR has just now opened uh, a new office in Washington, but we have our colleague, uh, our US colleague there, Jeremy Shapiro, um, and we maintain presence in European capitals on our side in Paris, Berlin, and Brussels, uh, so that we can work both sides um, of the foreign policy and domestic politics. Um, as far as that podcast goes, it kind of brings me innately into our work. We recorded that podcast after a kind of very long private discussion at the Heritage with a huge team of um, representatives of new right Republican think tanks um, representing all different sorts of views uh, in the Republican Party on what the foreign policy should look like and how U.S. Uh, should kind of um, focus in terms of its global posture versus focusing on issues at home or China. And I think, you know, what we've been trying to do since, you know, already two years ago, we've started doing that is really trying to make sense out of the cacophony of voices in the Republican Party. Um, if you think, you know, and, and this is perhaps kind of a point where Europeans have been between confused and maybe engaging in wishful thinking of seeing different messages and hearing different messages coming from the Republican Party. So when the um, Senate um, now minority leader who has announced that he's going to step down, Mitch McConnell, came to the Munich Security Conference, not this year, but last year, he held a speech reassuring Europeans that the Republican Party remains committed to Ukraine and, in fact, even more committed, and there's no reason to worry. Uh, this year, we have had on stage uh, the much younger uh, and pro Trumpian senator from Ohio, J.D. Vance, um, who was telling to the Europeans that, you know, even if the House passes the uh, package, the supplemental and the aid to Ukraine, um, the you know the us is and europe um do not have sufficient capacity to produce uh, and make a difference on the ground that the us has completely different priorities um including the southern border and uh china and taiwan uh, and that europeans absolutely need to step up um and pick up you know the pieces that the americans are going to leave behind so you know how do you make sense of that um, at the same time, you have Lindsey Graham, who is Trump's close ally and has traditionally been pro kind of uh, pro interventionist uh, who has advocated U.S. bombing the Revolutionary Guards headquarters in Iran. And then, you know, to that, you have a response of restrainers like J.D. Vance or, you know, the, the influencer who is still close to Trump camp, Steve Bannon or Tucker Carlson saying, you know, he's nuts. So this is what we've been doing is kind of trying to make sense of what are these kind of conflicting voices in the Republican Party tell us and who is in the end going to control Trump's foreign policy 
Um, because as we know, you know, personnel uh, and those who are going to be around Trump um, are, you know, not going to be the same sort of people that we've had in the first term. And I think that's another important point not to assume that Trump's second term is going to be the same as Trump's first term if he's elected. Uh, and secondly, how will these competing, if you want, tribes as we've, as we've defined them and their competing playbooks, how will they um, reconcile and translate into the foreign policy and what that will mean for Europe? Um, perhaps before we go into the details of some of the proposals uh, and policy ideas that are being put forward by these um, different groups in the Republican movement, if you want. Um, I just want to make a couple of points, just going back about the continuity in the US foreign policy, um, whether it's Biden or Trump uh, that gets reelected. Um, I agree with Leslie that there will be a huge difference in the style and the way certain things are implemented, even on these policy areas where we see a bipartisan consensus emerging. Um, I think no matter who is reelected, we have a couple of policy areas where there is a strong bipartisan consensus, partly in competition to these swing voters in the states that Bruce has identified, the work white, uh, white working class. Uh, whether it is trade and strategic industrial policy, we'll definitely see elements of continuity there uh, and need to prepare for Biden's second term if he gets reelected to be challenging on, the, on that front. Um, I agree also with Leslie that China, um, China as policy in China, despite the fact that if you read the kind of national security strategy documents of both presidents, there is, you know, an overreaching consensus between the parties that China is a strategic rival uh, that needs to be denied kind of the competitive edge in the industries of the future. And then the second that Taiwan is one of the main national security issues of the US. So despite this um, overreaching consensus, there is a difference between the parties and even within a Republican Party as how to approach uh, fulfillment of these goals. And I think here what we need to look at more um, on the Republican side is on one hand Trump's own focus and obsession, which is less about Taiwan, less about strategic industrial policy, and more about reducing the trade deficit. He continues to be obsessed with the trade deficit with Europe and China, and that is his focus number one. He has, you know, at many occasions said that uh, he would not treat the defense of Taiwan as uh, the national security priority. Um, and, uh, and multiple advisors from his first administration have confirmed this. Now, the interesting question is how, if given a second term, there would be how uh, Trump's ideas and focus on reducing the trade deficit would interact with a very detailed uh, and strategic China-Taiwan policy that is being developed by the current, uh, if you want, um, um, front runners uh, with the Heritage Foundation and affiliated think tanks uh, who are defining the foreign policy of the next administration, hoping to be um, selected and to be those future uh, members of the administration that will lead the policy. And they are at a completely different place from Trump. Um, these are, this is the group of uh, public intellectuals and former uh, government officials that we have called China prioritizers. Uh, who believe that um, Ukraine and the U.S. aid to Ukraine is in the direct conflict with the objective of deterring Chinese um, invasion of Taiwan, which they see as very likely impossible by 2027. And they think that the U.S. should have moved heaven and earth yesterday uh, to arm Taiwan to its teeth in order to close this window of opportunity for China to, to kind of, if you want, reunite with Taiwan through use of military force. And so there's kind of a lot of questions 
how um, Trump's lack of predictability, which is, I think, the only predictable thing about him in the end, is going to interact with a different sort of staff and leadership in the administration that we will have um, when compared to the first term. And in our minds, there's two groups uh, within the Republican Party that will probably dominate. Uh, one group are um, the so-called restrainers uh, who think that the U.S. needs to retrench um, and focus on the, on the domestic issues and the southern border. Uh, and then the China prioritizers, which basically, you know, are in absolute agreement on everything else, but think that the focus needs to be Taiwan. Um, some of the proposals that are now being developed currently and which will have significant impact on Europe if ever implemented, and we're not saying that they will be, we're basically looking at, okay, what are, what are these people preparing? Um, and, you know, what is a possible foreign policy of such a kind of restrainer slash prioritizer administration uh, are, first of all, concern Ukraine. Uh, Trump has promised to end the war in Ukraine uh, in his own style in 24 hours. We all know, you know, uh, that's more a figure of speech than an implementable uh, policy objective. However, uh, there is a consistent um, I think desire, not only uh, with Trump and his inner circle, but a large group of the Republicans on the restrainer and prioritizer side who are really defining the foreign policy um, right now to de-escalate with Russia, to make a deal in Ukraine, and to basically, you know, without any sort of concern about territorial integrity or sub sovereignty of Ukraine uh, and to focus on China. Now, the interesting question is, what would that sort of agreement look like? And more importantly, if Trump administration indeed goes ahead and tries to make a deal with Putin over Ukraine, how would Europeans react? Would we have a unified response on the European side uh, and within European NATO allies, or would this divide Europe and NATO? And we already know how Hungary, for instance, uh, would react. They have you know, publicly expressed the same desire uh, to end the war uh, and de-escalate no matter what impact on Ukraine's territory. Um, and you know, we also can assume that you know, countries, NATO countries like Turkey would likely follow. Um, we uh, the biggest question of course is where would the countries that really make impact like germany stand i think based on the uh, most recent agreement that was signed in berlin between german chancellor scholz and you uh, and zelensky it's very clear where german stands kind of um in terms of its commitment and policy the question is do Europeans have enough resources um, on its own if America withdraws its support to you know, continue supporting Ukraine and to make a difference on the ground and to actually take a different stance uh, and have a political strategy that would counter such a proposal? And it's unclear at the moment that there is even kind of a collective planning going on for such a scenario. Um, on NATO uh, and you know, other aspects of European security, Trump has consistently, um, you know, threatened to uh, leave NATO. He has, um, you know, in his speeches re most recently called on Russia, you know, said he would encourage Russia to attack those members who don't live up to 2%. You know, all that aside, we know that Senate has passed legislation that makes it almost impossible for the U.S. to depart. However, these are not um, the policy plans that are being developed currently, the kind of policies uh, that are being put forward by some of these restrainers are really to minimize, not to officially leave NATO, but to minimize U.S. role in NATO um, through the so-called dormant NATO um, agenda. 
uh, to force Europeans through rapid withdrawal of US forces in Europe to take over responsibility for military conventional capabilities and backfill um, for the US uh, to take over political kind of leadership in NATO uh, so that the US can focus on Asia. And in that kind of model, the US would retain more of a kind of um, extended deterrence role, but not much more. Um, we also hear among these voices calls uh, to withdraw troops from the, the remaining troops from Iraq and Syria, which are considered to be most exposed to Iranian attacks and those of Iranian proxies. And the, um, the killing of the US troops in Jordan uh, has just intensified that debate. Um, we know that Trump is obsessed with trade and trade deficits. He has seen, you know, always portrayed Europeans as having taken advantage of US security guarantees in order to kind of loop side unfair tra trade agreements onto the US. He has promised a um, universal baseline tariff uh, of 10% and then additionally re re reciprocal tariffs on uh, all the countries that have certain tariffs with the US. So we can definitely expect um, uh, return to um, to even kind of greater uh, trade war um, with obviously an acknowledgement that Biden administration has not really reversed all of the Trump's policy from the first term. Uh, and then finally on ideology, I think Bruce, you have said and shown really nicely in your presentation to what extent the Americans are deeply divided and polarized by that one slide where 70% of the Republican voters or of Trump voters would not acknowledge legitimacy of the elections. And I think that somewhat, in fact, it shows many things. It shows the deep polarization in the society and you'd probably the same sort of target group would have similar responses on many other issues, whether it's critical race theory, education, gender issues, um, and all of the culture wars, border immigration, and I think the question is, how does this cultural divide translate into the foreign policy? Um, and it does. And we've seen that during Trump's first term, he has showed um, close kind of affinity towards a Christian strongman in Europe, like Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban continues to be um, one of the European leaders that Trump praises every single time he has an opportunity. And Viktor Orban has, in fact, just recently endorsed Trump as uh, a president that would be, bring peace to Europe. And so I think, I'm going to ask you to wrap up slowly because we'll sure. have so so this so much is basically time just in terms of uh, the mood uh, and the inclinations of the Republican administration. If 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 you know, if we have another one is that I think we need to perhaps to come back uh, and, and wrap up here to Professor Hubner's point, you know, how do we convince the Americans? I think we need to spend less energy on trying to convince Americans not to change and more energy on trying to convince Europeans to change, trying to kind of get ourselves to really take these scenarios seriously and step up, especially on defense and military capabilities that will be needed to backfill in case America turns the way we're hoping it will not. So I will stop here. Sorry for going over time. No, thank you. It was all very interesting. I'm just, you know, co uh, conscious of time and that questions are already being asked by the audience. But in fact, some of them have been in a way addressed uh, by all of your comments. Um, well, first of all, uh, I also want to work, welcome Anthony Tisdale on this event, our former di director general. Uh, he's online, so welcome, Anthony. Um, we have a few questions, and I'll, I'll try to summarize them because they all connect to the same points and then turn to you for your comments. And I'll add one of my own uh, to that, given the, 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 the limited amount of time. So. We've received questions, first of all, I think I think one sort of overarching uh, question is what happens to the voters 
the potential voters of Nikki Haley? And that's two questions we have basically saying, um, you know, what's going to happen with non-populist Republicans? Are they still hoping to ride the Trump wave? Will they surrender? What will they do, I think, is the general question. It will be great to have a sense of what you think, all of you, about this. And then link to that another question that Bruce has already partially answered. Is there a chance Nikki Haley would decide to run as an independent? And what impact does this have? So I think it's generally questions about, you know, the non-Trumpist Republicans and what should we expect from, from that group. Uh, and then we've also received um, a question about... Um, Defense spending, uh, which essentially is, uh, it says that EU defense spending has been dropping from 2008 to 2015. Uh, is Trump necessary for the EU to build strategic autonomy? I would add to that that EU defense spending has been growing in the past few years, of course, following 2016, which does coincide with Trump getting elected. So there is perhaps, uh, there are some elements there to, to discuss, uh, but in general, I think it's more about the link between Trump and EU strategic autonomy and defense. Good day to discuss this, given the, the, the commission announcements. And then maybe um, picking up on what uh, Professor Hubner said uh, earlier about uh, the Trade and Technology Council. And Bruce, we've talked about this quite a bit. It's been an important vehicle for EU-US relations in the absence of a free trade agreement or anything of the sort. Um, and it's been an important vehicle for coordination on both China and Russia through the sanctions, which were, uh, you know, um, sort of discussed and, and, and agreed upon, and, but also export controls, um, uh, green tech, digital tech. I mean, there's a link to China in all of this. So it's been an important forum for this discussion. So what happens next, assuming, okay, if we had a Biden administration, we assume this will continue and maybe get more formalized, but what is going to be the mechanism of this engagement for the you know, these big actors of the West, the EU and the US on these issues, which really have to do with engaging on the issues with the rise of authoritarian powers. So um, with that, I maybe will start to, I'll start with Leslie. I'll go uh, in a, a different sequence this time. So Leslie, and any of these- Yeah, questions? sorry, Elena, the second question, it, are Europe and what are Europe and the US going to do on Trade and Tech uh, Council okay. and, uh, you know, everything that's yeah. in that. Sanctions, IRA, green tech, digital tech, all of that. In the event of, yeah, okay. I mean, on the Haley, you know, Bruce will say more because there is data on this. And I, I had looked at that relatively carefully. And they, as I understand it, they're divided. There are some Haley voters who say they would never vote for Donald Trump and there are others who, you know, who would. Um, I guess for me, the question is, uh, why did people vote for Nikki Haley? And some people will have voted for Nikki Haley because she's a woman who is not Donald Trump. She's, you know, all things being very relative, she's more moderate and seemingly, you know, engaging more in normal politics. Others will have voted for her because she's calling him out and it's a rejection. We know that, you know, wealthier Republicans have kind of gone her direction and he's he's won the rural voters. Um, my, my strong suspicion is that there are a lot of people who, you know, won't switch, but they also won't switch to Biden. And so, you know, the, the great concern, as I understand it, is that there are a lot of people that might not vote in this next election, but I would go back to my starting point, which is, it's one thing to say that in, you know, the gloomy gray of March. And it's quite another thing to say that, you know, when you're heading into the holiday season and you're kind of looking at your future and it feels all very different and much more consequential. So um, let's see where we are. I really do think that when it comes to elections, you cannot, you cannot read trend, only trend lines. It's agency, it's unknown um, unknowns, it's known unknowns, it's all of those things. A lot of things can happen. It's not, you know, there's a reason that there are elections um, because things do change. Um, I guess in terms of the broader kind of economic cooperation agenda transatlantically, is that sort of a question? If there were a Trump, I mean, I'm very dim <laughs> and, the, and the, you know, I, I'm very gloomy on this. And I guess the only thing I would say is how long does it take if Trump were to be elected, how long does it take before we start to see the wheels come off? And and the first administration, it took a long time. I mean, I remember meeting after meeting. I was personally horrified. This was all very new, this way of behaving on the global stage. 
But time after time, we had seminars, high level seminars with high level civil servants across security, defense, trade, uh, tech in the UK and Europeans at Chatham House. And under the rule, so many people said um, the same thing for about the first year and a half. Yeah, it's terrible at the level of, you know, the headline, but actually we're, we have still very good working relationships and things are, you know, going along. And they stopped saying that after Trump pulled out of the Iran deal and after he slapped steel and aluminum or aluminum tariffs um, on Europe. But that was a long ways in. And so, you know, does that continue to happen? Because even though he's got lots of plans and more importantly, those working on project 2025 have a lot of plans, how hard is it to put those in place? So there's a basic implementation question and um, all sorts of questions about who would actually work for Donald Trump. And I guess that goes, you know, again, to my broader kind of thesis question, which is, it's a question about America's democracy. Does the system work? And does the system work to constrain, you know, rogue behavior and pull it back to the center or to pull it back to America's longstanding foreign policy and economic priorities? And I think, you know, the system, given how severely it was tested right up at the top, shockingly resilient, actually. So I think that, you know, even though these leaders have very different worldviews and priorities and all the rest of it, it's it's not going to be as easy to unpick these relationships. They're not just government to government or bureaucrat to bureaucrat relationships. They exist across so many layers of the society and economy that I, I'm a little bit more optimistic, sort of. <laughs> sort of. Thank you, and and I'll I'll take one more minute to ask you, Leslie, because you said many would vote for Nikki Haley because she was a woman, and and by my calculation, uh, including for that reason, and I think this is going to be the first. Well, it's going to be two years since the reversal of Roe v. Wade uh, mm. when this election takes place. There was even a question about about this issue in the, in the chat. So I wonder if you could tell us, you know, thirty seconds, what do you think if the woman if whether you think the women vote will change in this election because we've seen the implications now of yeah people are fighting, they're fighting for you know again bruce will know a lot more about the data on this but they're, they're fighting for the suburban women we know that that matters a lot um the the question of choice is a hard one to predict it's not exactly going to be on the ballot in the midterms it was sort of on state level ballots there were specific things to fight for and i'm not sure if that's actually going to be true in the general election so whether it will be a mobilizer, you know, there's a generic headline of, you know, Trump is not kind of reigned over a period that's been good for women. Um, but, uh, you know, suburban women, again, let's leave it to Bruce. I suspect they'll peel away from Trump, but they will be calculating. Is this going to be good for my children? Are my children going to do well? The school choice question, um, you know, that's an important one. And people divide on that. So th these are really complicated issues. Some of them will be driven by state level politics and others not so much. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, I'll turn to you and then we'll go to Maida and then we could close by having uh, Professor Hubner's last response to the questions and the comments. So Bruce, to you. Great, thanks and uh, great questions. Um, I think we have to be very careful of the Nikki Haley question or the Robert Kennedy question. I think this is wishful thinking by people that they want alternatives. And I think we have to accept the fact we have two candidates. Those are the choices that we're gonna have in eight months and we need to understand what might happen. Um, on the issue of the impact of the abortion question and the women's rights to choose and this most recent in, in vitro fertilization decision in Alabama, um, the Democrats are going to try to make a huge uh, issue out of that and try to mobilize, especially women, uh, and say all of these these rights are at, at risk if you vote for Donald Trump. We don't know how that's going to happen. In, in twenty in the twenty twenty two congressional elections, people think it was a decisive factor. Um, uh, I think if if the IVF decision in Alabama hadn't happened. It might have been less decisive in this election, but this was a gift to the Democrats to mobilize women again. Uh, whether they can effectively do that remains to be seen, obviously. 
Um, uh, and I think the difficulty of the question is evident in Donald Trump's trying to be, a stay away from the question and b uh, not really come down with a definitive opinion because he realizes I think that this could cost him the election uh, and whether he continue to walk that tightrope uh, to to November we just don't know but I mean because obviously the right is going to be pushing him hard to come down definitively ban all abortions or whatever uh, so we'll see what how that that plays out. Uh, Come, come the uh, come the election day, and like I say, I mentioned Robert Kennedy for a minute because I know it didn't come up in our questions, but a number of people in the U.S. talk about it. Uh, you know, could he somehow hurt people? The the data seems to suggest that he would hurt probably both candidates about the same. Um, the most disturbing data point I've seen is that among his supporters, which is a very small number of people. A third of them, or actually four in ten of them, believe he's actually his father. So it's it's a little bit disturbing and a reminder that the public is not paying a whole lot of attention to these issues that we debate so closely. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I I would like to turn to Maida, but first to check, uh, Professor Hubner, if you would need to go at exactly. 4.30. In that case, we can ask you to come in. Okay, Maida, perhaps you can start uh, then with your response. Thanks. Helena, just not to kind of be repetitive about uh, all of the issues, I think Bruce is the best to talk about, um, the, you know, voting patterns and the elections. I just have, you know, one thought on that, given how razor thin the election outcomes have been and how especially in the swing states that Bruce has covered which you know Biden had won in uh, 2020 but where Trump is leading now I think it can go either way um, it's not just women's vote women by the way also suburban are divided on the culture wars transgender issues etc uh, we need to look at you know in Georgia in 2020 Biden won by 10,000 votes there is 10,000 naturalized Bosnians in Georgia. Uh, I don't know what is the number of them that have acquired the right to vote um, who are, you know, over 18. But they saw Biden during his first term, but during 2020 election, they saw Biden as a champion of kind of a U.S. foreign policy in the Balkans that they, you know, have benefited, benefited from and wanted to see right now. Uh, the U.S. policy in the Balkans of the, you know, uh, of, of the Biden administration has led many, just like the um, Arab American voters in Michigan, to kind of say they will either not vote uh, or maybe vote for Trump. So I think there will be a lot of, you know, questions around African American voters, um, Hispanic voters who have voted for Biden last elections and who seem uh, not eager to vote for him again. So. I really want Leslie to be right, uh, but I tend to be a kind of pessimist there. Uh, so I think the, you know, it can go either way because the, 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 the results are just so razor thin in these swing states. On the question of um, just impact on foreign policy, I, you know, again, the system has proven relatively resilient uh, during Trump's first term, but I think that was also significantly due to the fact that around Trump was the kind of old GOP elite. And if you think about what they back then restrained him from doing and kind of implementing his his worst, at least from the European point of view, impulses was, you know, uh, prevent him from withdrawing from Afghanistan, which then, by the way, Biden ended up doing. Uh, and has implemented one of the biggest shocks for the Germans and the Europeans with that decision. Um, they have prevented Trump from pulling troops out of Europe because they were of the opinion that that is an, a necessary component of American kind of strategic interest. The people who will be around him this time, judging by all indicators, will have precisely different impulses. They want him to pull out the troops from Europe. They want him to pull out the troops from Middle East. And I think we need to at least take seriously the possibility 
of this becoming a policy. The debate in the Republican Party currently is why are we even protecting the roots in the Red Sea? It's not our trading interest. It's European interest. They should be doing that. So there's this constant kind of push towards a policy which shifts burden, not even any more burden sharing, but burden shifting towards the Europeans to step up. And 2%, by the way, in their eyes is, you know, a starting point, not a ceiling. And so I just think we need to focus in Europe less on hoping and speculating and more on really taking this possibility as a you know serious prospect and doing what we can to prepare at least a political strategy and a unified response and then you know to follow from there thank you very much Mad. i think the nuta hubner may have had to go already because i cannot get a response so given the time um I will slowly uh, move to close the meeting. I want to thank all of you for your remarks. Um, I'm leaving this event wiser than I came in, but with a number of, you know, I have like um, a, a word cloud in my head of things we haven't spoken about uh, and what could happen between now and November, which is a long time in political time. Uh, but I, I, I think we will have other occasions and opportunities to exchange on this in the various formats in which we engage with you. So many thanks from my side. Um, I know we, even though it's not considered a very important Super Tuesday in terms of surprises, I'm sure many of us will be glued to our televisions this evening in Europe, <laughs> looking at what's happening. Uh, and, uh, and I really want to thank you for sort of setting the scene for those of us who do. Uh, for our constant cooperation with all your institutions. And I would like to thank my colleagues who helped in the organization of this event, especially uh, Cécile Charlier and Gisela Grieger. Uh, we'll try to get David Winston on another event or type of call because it's, uh, it's a shame we had to miss him, but clearly there was a lot to talk about. And on this note, I will hand over the virtual floor to Etienne for him to close. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena, for, for the very effective moderation and thank you to, to our speakers. Uh, uh, we are still 100 uh, online, so it was really a success uh, this afternoon. Just on my side to announce that we will have this next Thursday afternoon on Friday morning on site and online, so you can follow us uh, on WebEx. Uh, conference on foresight and better lawmaking. It's called Legislating for Future Generations, Trend and Challenges in Impact Assessment and Anticipatory Policymaking. So also a great subject. I encourage you to, to join. Thank you again and have a great day. Bye-bye.